Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth session of our series of Confidence in Managing Emergencies. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying the previous sessions. And uh, this session is going to be pretty short. It's just about the emergency drugs that you need to know and how to prescribe them safely. So uh, till now, can I get like uh, some feedback in terms of uh, has the information been clear? Because as we keep moving on in the sessions, all of the information will start getting consolidated. So everything that you've learned before will start making more and more sense as you move on to further sessions. So you guys have understood what we've discussed till now. Can I get a yes or a no? Okay, great. So let's start. What I'll be covering in this session will be your common emergency drugs, how to prescribe them, and a few cases so that you can understand the real life applications of learning these drugs and where they're actually useful. Okay. So we'll start with a very important drug. It's called epinephrine or adrenaline from all of you who must have ever done any adventure sports or bungee jumping or scuba diving. I'm sure you felt that adrenaline rush. So that's the drug that you actually have going through your body. So what it does is it's a alpha and beta agonist. So your nerve endings have certain receptors called alpha receptors and beta receptors. This goes and stimulates them. So an agonist is a stimulator. Uh, it's used in specifically anaphylaxis. So anytime a, a patient comes in with an allergic reaction who's having difficulty in breathing, we call that anaphylaxis. So that means their airway is collapsing. It's constricting, their airways are constricting. So we need to open it. We have uh, your uh, resuscitation. So when you're going into cardiac arrest, you have these uh, protocols and guidelines according to which we resuscitate someone. And we also give, uh, uh, you know, when there is a cardiac arrest, you give defibrillation. So along with that, we give epinephrine. Uh, so that's what ACLS arrest is. PA, PALS arrest is basically pediatric life support. So pediatric cardiac arrest when you have it, that's when it's given. And in severe asthma. So in very severe asthma, when all of your bronchodilators have failed, you will eventually end up giving epinephrine. Now, what you need to know here is when you're going to mess up with these drugs, because everyone will teach you, yes, these are the indications, these are the contraindications, but your real life practice basically teaches you where you go wrong. So to avoid those errors, that is the part you need to learn. So a lot of the times, because we're not sure about the dosages, you will make dosing errors in adrenaline especially because they're all multiples of 10. And one zero is a significant difference because it's a 10-fold error that you're making, right? It's 10 times more than it should have been or 10 times less than it should have been. So here where you see the dose, it's one milligram, one is to 10,000 IV. Or for anaphylaxis, 0.1 milligram, one is to 1,000 IM, right? So those 1 is to 1,000, 1 is to 10,000 is very important. What it means is how much you're diluting it. So always make sure, especially for emergency drugs, that you know their dosages very well. Another thing that you need to be careful about is tissue necrosis. You cannot give epinephrine. Like for anaphylaxis, it's fine. It's a low, it's lesser dose. But for larger doses, for cardiac, when you're resuscitating, when you're doing ACLS protocol, you have to give it via a central line. Because repeatedly, if you keep giving epinephrine in the same site or in the muscle or tissues, it will start causing necrosis. Now, because you're increasing your heart rate, you're giving it so much adrenaline, you can cause an arrhythmia. You can precipitate a dysrhythmia. 
again you cannot give it in hypertension your heart is already under a lot of stress you don't want to stress it out more right now what are the adverse drug reactions so suppose you've given adrenaline and now you're seeing that the patient has chest pain why because you know squad adrenaline the other heart is now pumping faster you you're uh, giving it palpitations so those are adverse drug reactions that you keep you need to keep in mind again you're stimulating the heart you're giving it palpitations you're asking it to pump more blood you're also increasing the blood pressure so if you think about these drugs logically it will be much easier for you to remember what they do and what can go wrong okay so once you have known adrenaline we'll move on to arrhythmics so in our ecg class we discuss some uh, arrhythmias we discuss broad complex then in the common medical emergencies uh, dr shyan covered uh, uh, narrow complex tachycardias and vtac and all of those so we'll now understand what those drugs actually do so amiodarone which uh, we use in uh, vtac or and wide complex tachy uh, dysrhythmias it basically goes to your heart muscle and it blocks the potassium outflow it's an anti arrhythmic so all of the anti arrhythmics essentially work on certain um channels that allow electrolytes to go in and out in your cardiac muscles so if the drug is blocking potassium outflow it's a class 3 anti arrhythmic if it's blocking sodium channels it's class 1 if it's blocking beta channels it's class 2 and if it's blocking calcium channels it's class 4 so you can see that it essentially blocks everything in your heart because these are the things that make your heart muscles move to a certain rhythm when you learned ecgs i had explained that it's basically the electricity in your heart that's being gener generated these uh, electrolytes are what generate those electricity right they basically are involved in making sure your cardiac muscles move in a certain rhythm now uh, when you uh, i remember shyan had also covered uh, the protocol he explained to you that you give a 300 mg iv bolus followed by 150 mg iv push again and then you keep checking the pulse because what you are trying to do is regulate the pulse is regulate the rhythm other uh, now what you need to be careful about is that it will cause your blood pressure to drop it causes hypotension because what you are trying to do is you are trying to calm down the heart it's the exact opposite of what your adrenaline was doing your adrenaline is precipitating those receptors it's asking those receptors to move forward work faster it's making the heart faster your angiotensin is doing the exact opposite it's causing the heart to slow down okay then you have adenosine adenosine again now you see it's the exact opposite it's causing a temporary heart block as compared to an adrenaline where it acts on the av node again in ecgs we learned where the impulses are coming from that's the av node can someone tell me where do the impulses go from the av node in the heart from the av node where is the electric impulse going bundle branch before that can someone tell me the entire pathway where does the impulse start from where does it go and where does it eventually end up you can unmute and answer or you can type whatever you prefer where does the impulse start from okay nice good he was answered sa node then the av node then the bundle of his and the right and left bundle branches good so your sa node another answer good sa node to av node to bundle of his right and left branch to purkinje correct 
so you understand once how the pathways are moving and then you can es essentially figure out where the drugs are acting so in this case it's acting on the av node so you, your s by that logic your ventricles your arrhythmias that are happening start from the atria and then move to the ventricles right electrical conduction so if it blocks the av node then it's not going to allow the electrical uh, impulses to flow downwards to your ventricles so it's going to make sure that the arrhythmias come under control okay um so the dose again adenosine a6 adenosine add 6 you give 6 milligram iv rapid push then you keep adding 6 you can give 12 milligram and you can repeat this twice right Again, now the contraindication. Now you're stopping the heart. You're causing a heart block. So it will go, your body will go into hypotension because it's not pumping enough blood. So your BP will drop. Then you can cause a second or third degree heart block because again, same logic, you're blocking the impulses. So you're going to cause the heart to block. Atrial fibrillation. Now you're blocking that temporary, the AV node from where you have atrial impulses coming. So you're basically stimulating another arrhythmia. So that's the interesting part of giving adenosine. Okay. And also bronchial asthma. We never give adenosine in an asthmatic patient. Can anyone tell me why? Why do we avoid giving adenosine in asthmatics? Or for that matter, we would also avoid giving amiodarone. MEBS interns, what happens in asthma and why can we not give adenosine or amiodarone? Exactly. So it causes constriction of airways. So if you remember the bronchospasm, right? Good. So if you remember what actually happens in asthma is your airways are getting constricted. So your treatment for that is a SABA, which is a beta agonist. Now, if you give any drug that is that has beta blocking properties, you will again cause a bron bronchoconstriction. So you will aggravate the asthma, right? Again, very logical. If you know how the drugs work and how the diseases that you're trying to treat work. Okay. Okay, moving on to hypertensive emergencies. Can anyone tell me what the normal blood pressure of a adult male is? What is the normal blood pressure, guys? Hundred to one forty, eighty to ninety. That's it. Diastolic, we only have ten millimeters of mercury ka gap. Yeah, 90 to, uh, 90 to 140, 60 by 90, right. Good. Okay. So hypertensive emergencies, basically the patient's blood pressure has shot up significantly more than what the normal range is. So how labetalol works, I'll go to the, I think I added two slides in it. Huh. So how labetalol works, it blocks alpha, beta 1 and beta 2 re uh, receptors in your body. So what it will do is it will cause your blood pressure to fall. It will cause dilation. Oops. Yeah. 
so where you use it is any hypertensive emergency you'll also use it in pregnancy induced hypertension so pregnancy induced hypertension can we can someone tell me the drug of choice for pre eclamp for eclampsia the consequence of pih pregnancy induced hypertension for those interested in obzengine mgs of course good okay so again what you need to remember is where can you not give it so second and third degree heart block bronchospasm same logic you're doing a beta agonist and you're going to make your bronchoconstriction worse and the side effects include headache and postural hy hy hypotension because again any time you give a hypertensive uh, patient a bp reducing drug there is a possibility that their bp will fall ex too much so that's why any time you're giving these drugs even an amlodipine you have to monitor their blood pressure so you have to keep checking their blood pressure say every 15 minutes to half an hour okay yeah so good you guys know what mgs of 4 is so moving from hypertensive emergencies in adults to pih um what pih is the blood the it's essentially an issue with your placenta because the placenta is not functioning properly it's causing the blood pressure of the mother to rise and as soon as the delivery happens once the placenta is out the blood pressure starts normalizing that's the most basic way i can explain pih to you the actual pathophysiology is a little more complicated where you have um the endothelium that goes into the placenta is getting is not forming properly and it happens at a certain number of weeks and things like that but basically what you need to know is placenta may problem hai once placenta comes out blood pressure will come down again so pih has different categories we'll cover all of this in the obs and gynae uh, emergency sessions as well but basically what you need to know is pih then you have pre eclampsia and then you have eclampsia pre eclampsia means that urine has now got albumin in it and yes uh, mandar very good it's absence of trophoblastic invasion to spiral arteries that is the more complicated way of saying the placenta is screwed <laughs> so where the arteries of the placenta get spoiled the blood pressure of the female rises so the last part the most extreme category of pregnancy induced hypertension is eclampsia where the female will start having seizures now you will not manage a eclampsia patient the same way you manage an adult having seizures sat in status because the pathophysiology is different so what you do is you actually give them magsef now um, magsef or magnesium sulfate have different regimen there is the prechart regimen and there are like four or five regimens that again we'll cover in obstetric and gynecology but what you need to understand is these drugs need to be given very carefully and they need to be constantly monitored because if you are giving magnesium sulfate you might uh, cause respiratory depression or hypotension which is again very worrying especially in a pregnant female because at any point if she goes into respiratory distress there is risk to the fetus so you have to make sure that you keep these things in mind when you are giving these drugs that is why emergency drugs are something that are essential to know not because they are life saving drugs of course but because of what can go wrong if you don't know them properly again magnesium sulfate is also given in asthma exacerbation that is your status asthmaticus when you are not able to control it according to the first and second level of asthma management drugs okay it's also given in pulseless torsades torsades is a type of arrhythmia uh, which again is very high level for you but theek hai you should know it's given in eclampsia it's given in torsades and it's given in asthma exacerbation and what you need to be careful about is respiratory depression uh, and hypotension now we we'll go from uh, hypertension to respiratory which is status uh, to epilepsy which is status epilepticus because we just covered 
uh, eclampsia. So now this is status epilepticus that is seizure in an adult who is obviously not pregnant. So what is the definition? Uh, we call it a continuous seizure that lasts for more than five minutes or if you have more than two seizures within a five minute period without any break in between. So where they don't come back to normal, right? So you have to understand that any seizure patient that's coming to you, the first thing that you will do is put in an IV line. Unme gel ko dalna hai. If you know a patient has come in with a history of seizure also, secure an IV line because they might seize again, right? What else will you do for a seizure patient before you start giving them medications? If you've ever seen, gone to the wards or seen the casualty, you'll know this. The nurses do this. For a seizure patient, what would you like to do? You've secured an IV line before and simultaneously something else you'd like to do. Protect the airway, yes. What else? Put in a mouth guard, yes. Another thing? What else would you like to do? So, okay. I'll give the answer. These are all real life practical things that you don't think about when you're reading a textbook. Seizure, seizure patients are likely to injure themselves. What happens is they will fall off the bed while having a seizure. Exactly. Well done, Sukhya. You tie their hands and legs you, or you raise the um, sides of the bed so that if they have a seizure, they don't fall off of it. Because what might actually happen is the patient comes in with a seizure You've not secured them and they fall off the bed and get a head injury. So you're essentially making the patient's condition worse. If you know the uh, physician's oath, the first thing is do no harm. So your first step should be making sure that the patient is secured and then they don't injure themselves while having the seizure. Okay, good. So if you can see the algorithm on the right, it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So your ABCs we've already covered in the very first session. You secure your ABCDE uh, and your don't ever forget the glucose because one of the commonest reasons why anyone goes into a seizure is because of uh, uh, hypo and hyperglycemia. So HGT in every seizure patient needs to be taken, right? So they've added it in the treatment algorithm itself, your airway, breathing, circulation, mm -hmm. DEF. Don't ever forget the glucose. Then you have the airway. You put them in a lateral decubitus position. Basically, you turn the patient on their side so that there is, uh, you know, it's lesser chance of them um, for, uh, basically not being able to breathe. So you're securing their airway. You might give them oxygen. You might then suction their oral secretions you have to establish IV access and you have to concurrently search for reversible causes because if it's a first episode of seizure in a non, you know, known case of uh, seizure disorder, then there might be some reason why it has happened. Now, the other causes can be an electrolyte imbalance. It can be, as we mentioned, glucose, very important. It can be, if there is a history of trauma, it can be precipitated by a brain bleed. So things like that, you have to keep looking for other causes while you're simultaneously managing the patient. So within the first five minutes, as you can see, time is important. In all your emergency conditions, time is the most important commodity that you have. Within five minutes, you need to start giving them first-line treatment. That is your benzodiazepines. This includes lorazepam, midazolam, diazepam, IV, or perrectal. So, if you ever, if you're a St. George intern, you must have heard staff saying Medaz Dinai. Medaz Dinai is Medazolam, which you can give IM or you can give lorazepam IV or diazepam IV or per rectal. 
in children especially we give them parenteral diazepam because it's very difficult to establish an iv line very quickly in a child especially neonates it takes three or four people to get one iv line in because ki someone has to hold their limb someone has to hold the body someone has to find a way in getting a vein in a child is very difficult so if you've ever seen nicu babies it takes a long time to secure an iv line so we give it per rectally this is an alternative even in an adult if you cannot secure an iv line because the patient is moving too much right and you're not able to uh, fix their arms and legs to get an iv line in give diazepam per per rectally okay this is your first 5 minutes now suppose the patient is fine they are not seizing anymore good enough but if the seizure seizures continue you move on to second line drugs your second line drugs include levetiracetam phosphenetoin or phenetoin and valproate sodium valproate now you can give basically any of these drugs in second line so you can if you have phenetoin sodium this is what we keep we give phenetoin you can give valproate or you can give levetiracetam these again i don't expect you to remember all the dosages but it's good to have this document on hand if you ever need to give give, give it in an emergency okay now you give the second line drug within 10 to 15 minutes and now the patient is still having seizures what do you do next you will consider airway advanced airway management because what happens is now their saturation might dro start dropping and you might have to give them paralytics right so you might have to give them a rocuronium these are all anesthetics now after a point your anti epileptics will be incompetent so that's when you move on to this refractory medication where your status epilepticus is continuing despite your epileptic medications so that's when you move on to propofol midazolam ketamine phenobarbital and then inhaled anesthetics you move on to ketamine uh, like then you move on to sorry rocuronium paralytics and all of these so that's where anesthesia you would then go on to consider an anesthesia resident or whoever your anesthetic on follows so again very important first line management lorazepam midaz diazepam any of these whatever you have available second line levetiracetam phenytoin or phosphenytoin valproate till now are you guys with me have you understood what i have explained yes no want me to explain anything again okay now so the same drugs that i explained to you the guidelines we'll see the drugs in detail so what diazepam or lorazepam basically what benzodiazepines do is it you have neurotransmitters one of those neurotransmitters is gaba so how when we were studying arrhythmias in the heart which are precipitated by electricity that's been generated because of certain electrolytes and receptors similarly in the brain how neurotransmitters work they conduct the electricity your neurons with the effect of inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitters now you have gaba and you have you must have heard of dopamine gaba then uh, what other neurotransmitters have you heard of uh then i'm thinking of drugs now uh, can anyone tell tell me any other neurotransmitters that you know dopamine glutamate good glycine yes i couldn't remember these for the life of me but okay so one of the neurotransmitters is gaba what diazepam does it enhances the inhibitory effect of gaba gaba itself is an inhibitory neurotransmitter uska effect wo zyada badhata hai so what you do is you give bol bolus doses of 1 to 2 mg iv acetylcholine yes yeah, very important and the indications for diazepam as we discussed status epilepticus delirium tremens agitation serotonin syndrome now again what the side effects are a respiratory depression because you are giving an inhibitory neurotransmitter to such an extent that it has gone to your brain's respiratory center and caused that to stop functioning so you are causing respiratory depression 
So especially in any asthmatic patient who's actively mm -hmm. seizing, we have our we have our emergency trolleys ready. We are always ready to intubate them. Because in case they go into respiratory depression, what do you do next? The only treatment you have for a collapsed airway is intubation, right? Your definitive management. So that's why you have to keep your emergency trolleys ready. Again, then second, like this other drug is phenytoin, sodium or phosphenytoin. Now what it does is it stabilizes the sodium channels. Same. So you have to understand everywhere in your body, there are certain channels that allow electrolytes to pass through. In the brain, you have voltage dependent sodium channels. It basically stabilizes them and stops the seizure activity. In our hospital, we give eptoin. I'm sure you must have all heard and seen of eptoin. So that eptoin is phenytoin sodium. It's stabilizing the neurons in your brain. Again, load, loading those 15 to 20 milligram per kg. Again, for status epilepticus. If you give it very quickly, you will cause hypotension or dysarrhythmia. So you have to monitor these patients constantly. Oops. So phosphenetoin, basically you have two variations. You have phenytoin and phosphenetoin. Phosphenetoin is a pro-drug. A pro-drug is basically the inactivated form of that drug, which goes into your body and gets activated. Okay. Phenobarbital. Phenobarbital is again now a barbiturate. It causes sedation, hypnosis, and anesthesia. So now your anti-epileptics have not worked and you want to move on to sedative drugs. You move on to phenobarbital. Again, status epilepticus, it causes respiratory depression and hypotension. Any anesthetic, if anyone ever asks you what can go wrong with an anesthetic agent is, Respiratory depression, right? Because oh, that's what your anesthetics are doing. It's causing sedation. So you sedate them to such a level that you mess up their respiratory center. So if you think about things logically, um, especially in your vivas, because a lot of the times you might see a drug and not remember anything about it. But if you know, say, where it's used or which category it is, you can answer something or the other. Okay. Moving on to diabetes. So we have regular insulin, which how it works is, how insulin works is very easy. It acts on your cells and causes uptake of the glucose peripherally. And it shifts your potassium intracellularly. So when we discuss DK, management that was discussed was you check the potassium level. Why? Because when you have less insulin and too much glucose in your body, it causes your potassium to move out of your cells. So as soon as you give insulin, the potassium goes back into your cells. The unit is important, 0.1 unit per kg bolus, followed by an infusion of 0.1 unit per kg per hour. Again, in the DK lecture, uh, which uh, Dr. Shayan took for you, he mentioned the NS, the normal saline guidelines for how you give the normal saline and the insulin guidelines. So insulin guideline is 0.1 unit per kg. Again, we know the indications, DK, HHS, hyperkalemia, because I just explained how the insulin works and how it moves the potassium back into your cells. Now, what can go wrong? Because you're moving so much potassium into the cell, the potassium decreases in your blood, you go into hypokalemia. Again, too much insulin, they might go into hypoglycemia. A lot of the times, you might prescribe too much insulin because you don't know what how much insulin you're supposed to give to a patient whose, uh, whose sugar levels have increased. So you might actually precipitate hypoglycemia. And uh, the thing is, only you can only give reg regular insulin IV. What we usually give is, if it's just, uh, it's not a patient in DK, if the sugar, sugar levels have just risen, you can also give insulin subcute. So IV insulin is regular insulin. Have you guys understood these ones? Insulin, your status epileptic is drugs. Can anyone tell me what other forms of insulin are there? Now, this is regular insulin. Why have we speci specified regular? 
irregular insulin concentration. There is, especially MUBS interns, there is this whole chapter in medicine on diabetes and the types of insulin, how they're made, what are the regimens. Good. So, Kavya, Priya, Sanyatan, short acting, long acting, ultra short, long, rapid acting, right. So, basically, you have four categories of insulin, short acting, ultra short acting, long acting and uh, regular insulin. So a combination of these insulin, types of insulin is used to manage a patient on diabetes. What you do is a basal bolus regimen where you might give a short acting insulin immediately, but to make sure that their sugar levels stay stable over a period of time, you would give a longer acting insulin. So that is a, ba a bolus and a basal or a basal and a bolus. So that's the logic behind the different kind of insulin preparations and what you need to give to which patient. But emergency conditions, you usually just give regular insulin. Okay, moving on to respiratory. Asthma patients who come in with an acute exacerbation of asthma and they're in status asthmaticus. Now this protocol, I'm sure, looks very complicated to you, but uh, let me simplify it. So any patient who's come in with known asthmatic, who's come in with an exacerbation, the first thing you'll do is check their saturation. If their saturation is dropping, you put them on oxygen support, right? Then you start giving the treatment. What you do is you give them bronchodilators. Bronchodilators are your albuterol, ipratropium bromide, theophylline. Theophylline can be given IV. Now there are different guidelines that specify different drugs that need to be given at what level. So if you look at British Thoracic, Guide, uh, Thoracic Society guidelines, those are going to be different from NICE guidelines. Uh, so what I'll do is, once I'll explain all the drugs to you, I'll send all these guidelines on the group. What you need to know is how the drugs work and what order do you give the drugs in. That much if you know is good enough. So you have albuterol, which is the brand name is Ventolin or uh, Proventil. You have ipratropium bromide. Again, these are all inhalational. You have theophylline IV. Then bronco after bronchodilators, you have other options that are corticosteroids. You, after corticosteroids, you can also give parenteral magnesium. And you can also give antibiotics if you're suspecting that the asthmatic patient has developed an infection. So if they've got pneumonia and if they've come with a fever yeah. and things like that, then you can also give them antibiotics. Last case, worst case scenario, you intubate and ventilate, right? Okay. So, albuterol or salbutamol, what they do is basically now it's a beta, beta 2 agonist. It's the exact opposite of our antagonist, right? So, what you use it as in acute bronchospasm and hyperkalemia. What can it do? Now, because it's stimulating your beta receptors, we had first seen beta blockers, right? They were blocking our alpha and beta channels, your antiarrhythmic. So their side effect was bronchoconstriction. Now you're giving a drug, which is a bronchodilator, which is causing beta uh, receptors to work more. It's an agonist. So it will cause tachycardia. Again, very logical. And this is also, if you're planning on giving any entrance exam, this is how they'll confuse you. All they need to do is change an agonist to an antagonist and your answer goes wrong. Even in real life, you have to make sure that you know where you're giving an agonist and where you're giving, giving an antagonist. Because you can basically make the patient significantly worse. So tachycardia, hypokalemia, and hyperglycemia is where you need to be careful about. So what is this? What is this an image of on your screen? You have the albutamol, albuterol inhalation. What is this gray thing? Yes, MDI, Vandar. Can someone tell me the full form? What is an MDI? 
Peter does in here exactly. So what it actually does is once you put this can, it has drugs in it. The inhaler will only give a specific dose of that drug that is given in an inhalational format. So I'm sure when you studied Pharmac in second year, it's been a while since I've done it, but uh, when you studied second year Pharmac in your practicals, they must have taught you about different forms of drug delivery. So one of these forms is aerosol. The way these particles are being converted is they're convert being converted into inhalational droplets and then you inhale them and they go di directly into your airway. So it's a better method of getting them to where they need to act. Now, when you have asthmatic patients, it is very important to make sure that their inhaler technique is proper because a lot of the times we'll just people will just give them the medicine, lick it, they will say, inhaler, take it. No one will explain how to take the inhaler, how do you use it, what you are supposed to do. This is especially important in pediatrics because again, asthma is very common in children. And to children, if you don't explain, and to their parents especially, how it needs to be taken, they'll never understand it. And those same children will go, go on to become adults and then they'll keep coming to your casualty with exacerbations. But you'll never figure out why. So one of the reasons why is because they're not taking the inhaler properly. Properly, Their technique is not correct. So let's see what the proper way of taking the inhaler is. Okay, did you guys understand? If you want, I'll play it again. Yes or no? Did you understand what the proper inhaler technique was and how it was used with the spacer? You want me to play it again? Okay. Is the audio there? Like, can you hear what they're explaining in the video? Okay, okay there's no audio. Fine, um, I'll send the video on the WhatsApp group again. Let's see what she's explaining at least. So you take off the inhaler cap and make sure that the mouthpiece and the spray hole are clean. Shake the inhaler 10 to 15 times. You attach the end of the inhaler to the spacer. Inhale a deep breath, breathe out. Now this is important. How do you hold the inhaler? You have to tell them to breathe in slowly and deeply so that all the air goes in and you have to hold it. Okay. 
I'll send the video again on the group so you can watch it. Okay, so we've understood how to manage asthma patients, status asthmaticus, and we need to make sure that when you're sending them home, they know how to take their inhaler properly. Okay. okay, moving on to analgesics. One of the most common complaints anyone will ever come to you is dard ho hai, pain. Kabhi haath mein dard ho raha hai, pair mein dard ho raha hai, sar mein dard ho raha hai. Any and everywhere in the body, people will come to you with pain. And especially older people will come in saying body ache. Just pure, pure chari mein dard ho raha hai. So what do you do? So there are different uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, and analgesics. You also have uh, antipyretics and uh, other anti-inflammatory drugs. So two of them I'm covering here. Aspirin. Why I'm covering aspirin is because it has multiple uses. You can use it as an analgesic. You can use it, use it as an antipyretic and anti-inflammatory and for ischemic heart disease. Right? And for TIA. Now, what you need to remember with aspirin is you cannot give it if the patient has a GI bleed. So, uh, a, a GI bleed patient, if he comes to you with MI, who's having an MI, you will not give them an aspirin. Right? You cannot give it again in bronchial asthma, bleeding tendencies, gout. And the side effect of aspirin is salicylism. If you basically what it means is too much aspirin is building up into your body, which can lead to vertigo and tinnitus. These are very specific side effects for aspirin. If you have a patient, suppose there is an auntie who's been who has been taking aspirin for say 10 years for her uh, rheumatic conditions. She will come with a complaint of tinnitus. Ki kaan mein se awaz aati hai, jhanjana aat wali awaz aati hai. So that is basically, it means that she's going into salicylism. Then again, you can precipitate wheeze and breathlessness and Ray's syndrome. Does anyone know what Ray's syndrome is? I'll give you a hint. It's related to children in pediatrics. Hepatocyte necrosis, yes, something more than that. Why is the hepatocyte necrosis happening? What is the issue in those children usually? Following influenza, okay. Anything else? Hepatic encephalopathy, okay. Anything else anyone wants to try? Viral disease pre precipitated by aspirin. Okay. Okay, fine. What I'll do is I'll send you guys the explanation again on the group because uh, Ray syndrome is something you need to be careful about, especially in pediatrics. Because these children, if you prescribe them aspirin, they'll deteriorate very quickly. So I'll explain the whole mechanism of what exactly is happening when you're giving them aspirin. Okay, paracetamol. Paracetamol, every patient ever will come to you and be like, pharmacy pe gaye the, bukhar ka goli diya usne, humne le liya. Now, these patients have no idea what they're being given, how much dose it is. So that is dangerous. But in most cases, bukhar ka goli when they give it to them is paracetamol. So you have your normal PCM 500 mg, you also have Dolo 650. And basically, the dose can be from 500 mg to 1000 mg per day. Indication again, fever, pain relief. Contraindication is liver condition. So, because your paracetamol gets uh, metabolized in the liver, anytime you have anything that affects your liver, so and chronic alcoholic or say uh, fatty liver disease and all of those, you would avoid giving paracetamol or mostly any drug that gets metabolized in the liver. Now, what it can do in large doses is, again, getting metabolized in the liver, you will lead to paracetamol poisoning. 
you will give so much of paracetamol that it will start making toxins in the body which go and affect your liver. You can have paracetamol induced rashes, nausea and vomiting and things like that. Okay. Coming to electrolyte imbalances, calcium gluconate, very important drug. Uh, while I was an intern in JJ, we, I mean, it was a very theoretical thing. They used to ask us, how do you give calcium gluconate? And once you join internship, you see the patients who need, uh, basically who come with hyperkalemia. It's a treatment for hyperkalemia. It's, hyperkalemia is very common and you would give them calcium gluconate. So how it works is it increases the serum calcium uh, and it stabilizes your cardiac muscles, the myocytes. So it's not like it's counteracting the potassium that's in your body, but what it's doing is it's protecting your heart from the effect of the excess potassium. Now you have to give 10% calcium gluconate IV slow. The most important thing that you learn in internship and it's very frustrating but calcium gluconate needs to be given slowly over a period of at least 10 minutes. Where you, which is very annoying to do when you have like 50 patients and eight patient of calcium gluconate, you cannot keep seeing that it's going or not. So what we used to do is we would give calcium gluconate, push it a little, collection, do collections of two other patients, come back, push a little more calcium gluconate. So you understand that uh, the practical way of doing things can sometimes be very different. And especially when you're giving calcium gluconate, it's important mm -hmm. to monitor the pulse of the patient. Because what you can precipitate is a dysrhythmia. So calcium gluconate, if you're giving over 10 minutes, if that patient you know, has severe hyperkalemia, make sure that you're monitoring that patient. Because you can precipitate an arrhythmia. Again, tetany. Tetany is basically you're giving them too much calcium. Mm -hmm. So hypercalcemia, may you get tetany. Um, and if you're giving calcium chloride, it's three times more potent than calcium gluconate. So you can get inflammation of the veins. So thrombophlebitis. Okay. MI, we discussed this last time as well. And I have put in a question again in the uh, pre and post session questionnaires because that's how important MI management is. We already covered aspirin, right? So it's an antiplatelet drug, which is also used for pain relief. We have morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, aspirin, clopidogrel, and atorvastatin. So in case of MI, for pain relief, the pain is so severe that you're using morphine. The reason why I have put in stat dose of uh, MI management in the questionnaire, and I'm covering it again, is because you need to realize that chest pain patients are not coming in with a normal kind of pain where you're like, oh, body ache ho raha hai, ya fir, you know, uh, dard hai. they're coming in with severe pain. So you're giving them a morphine. We don't do this usually. Uh, very rarely have I seen morphine being given. You will give a sublingual sorbitrate, rate, you'll give a nitrate and things like that. But you have to understand that the pain severity is a lot more in an MI patient. Okay, so, and then you have your uh, loading dose, that's your aspirin, clopidogrel, atorvastatin. You can uh, also give, say, beta blockers and uh, ACE inhibitors. So this slide, especially, you have to know this like the back of your hand. Because MI, I swear, if as a physician, you cannot treat MI, then your degree should be taken away from you. Because MI is one thing that is very common and that you need to know through and through. Okay, moving on. So what my idea of going from normal pain to MI pain was to show you that there is a way to increase the pain management that you're giving to patients. In India, especially, we tend to not take pa patients' pain very seriously. But if you move towards oncology and if you start, you know, uh, looking at international guidelines, you see that they are very responsive to people's pain. And especially when you look at oncology patients, koi Tata ka patient aega, kabhi uski file dekho ge na, so they'll be on very high levels of pain management drugs. Because they're in so much pain and they're on palliative care. 
where these opioids might have severe side effects but their pain needs to be managed first so it's a risk benefit ratio that you're assessing so your step one is mostly what you will be giving your NSAIDs, your aspirin, your uh, uh, diclofenac and all of those are step one drugs. Then you move on to step two drugs, your opioids from mild to moderate pain plus non-opioids plus other adjuvants. Then again, you keep increasing. So what the WHO did was they made this pain ladder where they gave you a series of drugs that you can give as the intensity of the pain increases. And they've now modified it to include minimally invasive treatments because now you can even do, uh, for pain management especially, you can do nerve blocks, you can do fascia blocks, where if there is, suppose a femur fracture patient comes in, they're coming in with a severe amount of pain. So if, in uh, international guidelines, you can also give them a nerve block, fascia us region ka pura block kar denge so that you don't feel any pain in that area. Basically how you, before suturing, you give lignocaine to block the local area. Similarly, for a femur pain, you can give a nerve block in that region. So what you need to understand is you need to take your patient's pain seriously and pain relief again is very important. Okay, uh, before I move on to the next category, can anyone tell me what drug you will give in neuropathic pain? nerve pain specifically the patient it will come to you with complaints ki aise, uh, tingling jaisa lagta hai and bahut dard hota hai, hota hai. pregabalin good pregabalin gabapentin neurobion gabapentin pregabalin good so in neuropathic pain the reason why we give these drugs and not an aspirin or a diclofenac is the way the pain is being generated and the pathophysiology behind it is very different from the way your uh, normal somatic pain is being generated. So in neuropathic pain, again, it's neurotransmitters that are involved. So to block those, you have to give a gabapentin and a pregabalin. In somatic pain, you have your inflammatory markers that are being generated. So that's why you're giving an anti-inflammatory drug. You're giving an NSAID. Right, so if you start thinking of these, if you start thinking of medicine in basic blocks, it becomes a lot simpler to understand. Okay, poisonings. This section is personally a lot of fun to learn because poisonings are important emergencies to know and very fun to understand. So OP poisoning, uh, what it is, organophosphate includes Malathion, penthion, formathion, and glycophosphate. There are a lot of organophosphates. Where they're actually found is pesticides. So you will likely see a farmer or someone who lives in a rural area who's tried to say commit suicide or accidentally ingested organophosphates. So what it does is it blocks your acetylcholine esterase enzyme. So it increases your acetylcholine level in your body. When we studied neurotransmitters, one of the neurotransmitters that you mentioned was acetylcholine. So when this level increases in your body, you have more cholinergic activity. And this leads to certain symptoms. Now you have certain muscarinic symptoms, nicotinic symptoms, and central symptoms because your acetylcholine acts on these three types of receptors. So you have your specific symptoms, which are called the sludge symptoms, salivation, lacrimation, urination, diarrhea, GI upset, and emesis. You have your dumbbell set of uh, symptoms, that is diaphoresis and diarrhea, urination, meiosis. This is a very important symptom to have, meiosis, because when a patient comes to you, the way we assess the patient's improvement is by checking their pupils. Bradycardia, bronchospasm, bronchorrhea, emesis, excess lacrimation, and salivation. So again, these mnemonics make it much easier for you to remember what the patient will present to. Um, I had actually gone for an interview and they had asked me, uh, have you ever seen a case of OP poisoning? So I, tell, I had to tell them, no, I haven't because uh, I live in an urban area. It's less likely for me to get patients from rural areas who come in and take in pesticides and try to, you know, commit suicide and all of that. 
for those of you who have done your oral postings, you'll realize that you'll see a lot more of these patients. And what the question that they asked me was, how do you identify a patient of OP poisoning? How do you come to know the OP poisoning ka patient? Hai? There is a very specific way of knowing before you've even looked at the patient. Does anyone know what it is? And this is something you would mostly only know if you've seen the patient. It's not something you can uh, get from textbooks. Good, garlicky odor. So what they said was there is a very specific smell of OP poisoning, which again, no one tells you that when you're reading a textbook, there is a sense of sight. There is a sense of, to some extent, extent they can describe touch, but no one can describe a smell to you. So what they told me was, uh, as soon as the patient is brought in, you will be able to tell that's open poisoning because of the way they smell. Okay. Moving on to management. So the first thing you need to do is you need to decontaminate their skin. You need to remove their contaminated clothes, wash them. Because what happens is the OP, uh, organophosphates are still in their clothing. So it will keep getting permeated through their skin and it will st still keep going into the body. Their eyes, you need to irrigate their eyes with normal saline and you need to insert a Rhinos tube and wash their stomach out. When we do we not insert a Rhinos tube in what kind of poisoning? When will you never insert a rail tube? Kerosene, okay. What else? Kerosene, okay. Caustic poisonings, yes. So any poisoning that burns, so any acid or alkali that's burning your internal system, if you put in a Ryles tube and you try to wash it out, as, as it's coming up, it's going to burn your entire system. And that acid or alkali will react with the saline that you're giving. So you cannot wash it with NS, corrosive poisoning. Yes. Good. So moving on to what is the treatment? So the antidote for OP poisoning is atropine. Atropine, we'll see in the next slide. What it does is it's an antagonist of acetylcholine. So in OP poisoning, what we saw was acetylcholine level is increasing. If you give atropine, it will competitively inhibit that acetylcholine. It's an antagonist, right? And then you give a pralidoxine. So the pralidoxine will uh, uh, replenish the acetylcholine esterase levels because you need this acetylcholine esterase enzyme to, to break down the acetylcholine. So again, very logical. And those are the doses, one to two milligram IV, one to two milligrams in 100 to 150 ml in NS. So how do you assess that the patient is getting better is you check their pupils. There is something which was very specifically, I still remember from my second year pharmac lectures, atropinization of pupils. You see that their pupils are going from pinpoint to normal to dilated. So as soon as they start dilating, you, you realize that the treatment that you're giving is working. So again, these patients need to be monitored. So atropine, anticholinergic drug, it's used in OP poisoning and bradycardia. So one of the symptoms of OP poisoning was bradycardia and bronchospasm. And the same logic, atropine, is used for adult bradycardia. Now the contraindications. The four P's of when you cannot give atropine is paralytic ileus, psychosis, pyloric stenosis, and prostatomegaly. In these four conditions, you cannot give atropine. And where you'll get into trouble, again, their hyperthermic patients, tachydysthmias, and all of that can be precipitated by atropine. Okay, so other poisonings that you need to know and how you can remember their antidote. So acetaminophen, tylenol, or paracetamol. In a paracetamol overdose, you give NAC, N-acetylcysteine. So acetaminophen, acetylcysteine, again, ACE, PYL, tylenol. 
opioids that is narcotics you give na no, uh, naloxone so narcotics naloxone right and o and opioids beta blockers we give glucagon ethylene glycol we give formiprazole benzodiazepine flumazenil digoxin digoxin immune fab iron desferoxamine uh, desferoxamine is an iron chelating agent so which patients would be at risk of iron overdose where would you give desferoxamine commonly thalassemia very good because any patient who is getting repeated blood transfusions will get a build up of iron levels in their body to get rid of those iron levels you have to give desferoxamine those interns posted in st george in thalassemia please know this you should know this like the back of your hand okay copper copper poisoning you give penicillin okay so you understand how your own therapies where for thalassemia you need to give them blood transfusion also has certain drawbacks so you need to know how to manage those cases okay moving on to the last section we'll do this quickly you need to know how to prescribe properly so there are these 10 principles of good prescribing be clear clear about the reasons for prescribing so you need to have a diagnosis in mind some sort of a diagnosis before you start prescribing don't just prescribe things willy nilly and if you don't know what to prescribe it's okay escalate ask someone above you but do not prescribe wrong medicine second take into account the patient's medication history so now an asthmatic patient as we discussed you will not give them certain drugs right that will precipitate their asthma so you need to make So make sure that you ask them which medications they're on. Take into account other individual factors. So, is it a diabetic patient? Is it a hypertensive patient? You need to take into account the patient's ideas, concerns, and expectations. If the patient does not want to take injections, you cannot force them to take it. You can counsel them, saying you have suppose a fever patient has come with very high fever. You might have to counsel them, especially in pediatrics, saying that bukhar is very high. अगर हम गोली देंगे उससे कम नहीं होगा राइट यू हैव टू लर्न हाउ टू काउंसिल दैम बट यू हैव टू टेक देयर कंसर्न इन टू अकाउंट फिफ्थ यू हैव टू सिलेक्ट इफेक्टिव सेफ कॉस्ट इफेक्टिव मेडिसिन यू कैन नॉट प्रिस्क्राइब ड्रग्स दैट आर वेरी एक्सपेंसिव द पेशेंट हैज टू बी एबल टू अफोर्ड इट राइट अगेन यू हैव टू अडियर टू नेशनल गाइडलाइंस एंड लोकल फॉर्मुलरीज certain drugs might not be available in india that are available abroad or certain drugs are available in india which are prescribed over the counter which are not available in other countries so you have to make sure that wherever you are practicing you know that country's guidelines and you know what is available where even hospital to hospital you might have certain variations in which drugs are available and which are not available and also which drugs are prescribed so you have to know these things when you start working you have to write unambiguous legal prescriptions using the correct documentation you cannot write it's not like writing a theory exam where you scribbled something and it's fine it's an actual medication that a patient is going to take so you have to write these things carefully you have to monitor the beneficial and adverse effects of medication like i mentioned if you are giving calcium gluconate you have to monitor the patient check if they Might develop an arrhythmia. You have to check their pulse. If you are giving an anesthetic agent, you have to make sure that you are monitoring them so that they don't go into respiratory depression. Right? You have to communicate and document the prescribing descriptions, uh, decisions, and the reasons for them. A lot of the times, the patients will just come with the prescription, and nothing will be written about why it was given. Right? So it's always better put in two lines of history. Even if the patient is just coming with cough and cold. Right, cough and cold, and then give your prescription. It's fine. It's only going to take you thirty seconds more, but you can do it. It's a better thing to do. And the most important point: prescribe within the limitations of your knowledge, skills, and experience. No one expects you to know everything in medicine. You are going to learn with experience. If you don't know what to give, do not give it. Escalate. Ask before prescribing something wrong. Okay. Again. Parmac second year, how to make an ideal prescription and what are the parts of a prescription? You have the date, 
to know the patient's name, their details, age, address. You have that all of that comes in your superscription. Then you have your inscription, which medications you're giving. Right? Superscription you've given your Rx. Your Rx actually means the recipe. Then you give your medication, which is your inscription. You have your subscription, your instructions to the pharmacist that you only want them to give, say, 30, 30 drugs, right? Or 30 pills. Then you have your signature and you have your direction for the patient, right? And then you have your transcription and your signature. Any other special instructions, you can write that. The refill when it gets over, right? So on your right is an actual prescription that is done quite well. They've given the patient's details. They've given their address, age, sex, date, and they've given FESO4 tablets. 30 tablets should be given. That hashtag is number of tablets. 30 tablets, their signature. Then they've given ascorbic acid, 500 mg, 30 tablets. Um, signature, what they're trying to tell the patient once a day, AD. And then the physician sign, licensing number, and whatever registration number they have. So this is a well-written prescription. Again, now there is a certain do not use list according to certain guidelines where when we write, suppose you're giving insulin, we tend to write two units. So two U, if you write a U, it might look like a zero. And there is a huge difference between a two unit of insulin and 20 units of insulin. So what they say is don't write a U, write unit. Again, instead of international unit, write international unit. Instead of OD, BD, QD, uh, whatever Q, QD, use daily or put that 100 or 001 because again, it makes more sense and it's easier to understand. It's clear. In QOD, use every other day because the patient might not understand if you've written QD or QOD, right? Patient goes to pata bhi nahi hota ki kya hai. You have to explain it to them. So in, instead of explaining it to them, you can also write it in the prescription itself. Then you have trailing zeros, lack of leading zeros. You MS, you use magnesium sulfate or morphine sulfate. So write the whole name of the drug. Don't write an acronym. MSO4, MGSO4, use morphine sulfate or magnesium sulfate because all of these things that you're writing are important drugs and miscommunications can happen. So it's dangerous for the patient. Okay. Uh, we're moving on to cases now. 35-year-old uh, male patient known diabetic on insulin bought by relatives unconscious to the casual. His BP is 110-90, pulse is 88, Saturation is 98 on 2 mil. HGT is 52. What would you like to give? We discussed what happens when there is too much sugar. Now, this is the opposite. His HGT is 52. He's in hypoglycemia. What will you give the patient? Dextrose. Dextrose, good. Anyone knows how much dextrose? Dextrose 5%, 10%, D25, D25. You can give D25 because there is a, a sugar level that's quite low. You can give them D25. So immediately you will put an IV line in and you will give them D25. Good. Case two. It's the same case as before. Can anyone tell me the management? 75 year old male, left side chest pain. By now, you should know these cases like the back of your hand. You should know what an MI looks like. I have asked this in three sessions now. The VP is 11080. What is your immediate management? Anterior MI, yes. Loading dose. What is the loading dose? You can't write road, loading dose now. We've said, spent the entire one hour discussing the drugs that we give. <laughs> Aspirin, clopidogrel, and one more drug. Atorva. Great. What will you give for pain relief? 
ऑक्सीजन ऑफ सैचुरेशन इन हो यस व्हाट एल्स विल यू गेट फॉर पेन रिलीफ मॉर्फिन इफ अवेलेबल यस व्हाट एल्स कैन यू गिव फॉर पेन रिलीफ मोनाक यस मॉर्फिन व्हाट इज मोर इजी टू गिव टू अ पेशेंट देन मॉर्फिन ये ये पेशेंट्स घर पे भी लेके आ जाते हैं सॉर्बेट रेट एक्जैक्टली सब लिंगनोल सॉर्बेट रेट इफ any of you have a cardiac patient at home it's always better to keep sublingual sorbitrate in your house as well because it's a sublingual medicine immediately you can give it and it causes pain relief morphine would be should be avoided in uh, right ventricular mi it can be i mean it depends on the guidelines ma'am please explain morphine should be avoided it depends on the guidelines not every guideline says that it should be avoided because all it's doing is pain relief right if i find something specific according to a specific guideline i'll share it on the group i'll let you know but uh, as far as i know uh, different guidelines say different things for uh, what mo if morphine can be given in right ventricular mi or not okay so we have established monac case 3 Seventy-five year old female brought for the casualty with palpitations. BP is one forty ninety. ECG is done. New diagnosis that VTAC. What would you like to give? What would be your drug of choice? I'm your darling. I'm your darling. I'm your darling. Oh my God! So many people. I'm your darling. <laughs> Good. Well done. so by now you know which drugs are to be given in which arrhythmia if possible i'll also make a chart of uh, which drug is given in which arrhythmia along with the ecg finding so you can always refer to it if uh, you ever get an ecg like that okay good case for 17 year old girl comes casualty with complaints of itching and hives no difficulty in breathing respiratory rate 22 how will you manage this patient what would you like to give a patient who's come with allergic reaction hydrocortisone antihistamine yes so you give an antihistamine and a hydrocortisone so you give avil and hydrocortisone so if she had difficulty in breathing what would you give so adrenaline yes What is the dose? Does anyone remember? It was the first slide. Adrenaline, I am zero point five mg. What is the one is to one is to what? One is to one thousand. Yes, good. So that one is to one thousand is equally important as the zero point five mg. I think. Okay, good. Sorry, not I V I M. Okay. Case five. Now this is a fun question. Can you identify the problems in these prescriptions? What is wrong? If anyone wants to unmute, you can unmute. This is a very fun question. Very bad handwriting. Yeah. Anything else? You're right. The issue here is you can't understand what the drug is. You can understand paracetamol. You can sort of understand there's an N here and Himalayan or something. First of all, it looks like a rend rendil. In this, you can't understand anything. At least I can't. What else is wrong? TID not to be written. Okay. Anything else? Can you see anything else that's wrong with the prescription? Age isn't written. Good. Age here is missing. So you don't know if it's an adult, if it's a child. Anything else? 
Nothing else. Everything else is fine. Diagnosis, okay. Sign is missing, yes. What else along with the sign? Sign with date, okay. So the sign, any time you sign a prescription, your uh, registration number needs to be written. Yeah, registration number. So your sign, your registration number is important because uh, ideally any drug that you're prescribing can only be prescribed by a registered medical practitioner. That is why even as interns, we were told don't sign your own sign because you're on a provisional registration. You are working under the um, authority of your residents and your head of department and head of unit. So you're not authorized to write prescriptions on your registration number. Right. After in Rx also, yes. So this one doesn't have Rx in it. This one has it. Okay, good. So you're essentially figuring out the way to write good prescriptions. And the thing is, no one teaches you this after second year. In second year, it's very theoretical. But once you start writing prescriptions, because a lot of the patients will be referred to you with just a parchi. And the only thing written is uh, aspirin or whatever, one, one drug they'll write and there's no context to it. So don't be those physicians going forward. Try to write good prescriptions. Try to make sure that you're giving some history, you're signing it properly, the details are written well and things like that. So your documentation is just as important as your treatment. That's it. That's it for today's session. Do you guys have any questions? And these are all the references. I'll send the presentation so you can read more. Okay, we'll end the session here. Thank you for joining everyone. And thank you for actively participating. It's great to see that even after four sessions, you're all here and uh, answering questions, even though you're online. <laughs>